Albert Breer had a really good comp. First of all, give shout out to Breer, who's been money this offseason. Mm-hmm. And he clearly has ties to the Ohio State program, alma mater, alumni, and then Austin Ford, you know, his ties back to New England. Breer had some interesting insight as it relates to the Arizona Cardinals and their courtship with Marvin Harrison Jr. that we've known started last offseason. The Cardinals viewed Marvin Harrison Jr. at C.J. Stroud's pro day at Ohio State because sources told Breer, yeah, if you don't do it now, you probably aren't going to get a chance to do it again, which is pretty pretty nuts. But, Damon, let's wow. get to Breer's comments here on the Cardinals and MHJ. This is uh, via SI. Austin Ford and Coach Gannon spent 18 minutes with him at the NFL Combine, wanted to get to know him. What they learned was, first and foremost, he wasn't loud or bolster, uh, bolsterous Boisterous. or seeking, seeking attention. Like a lot of guys at his position, they also saw how detailed of a plan he had for everything football and how handling of the pre-draft process was just an example of that. This is the money quote. He asked if the Cardinals needed to see anything at his pro day. They said, nope, we're good. How about that? <laughs> you love to see a good plan uh, work to perfection, right? carries on here with uh Breer Johnny yeah the Cardinals wanted to mimic this is for Marvin's top 30 visit what an in-season Wednesday would look like for Harrison minus the on-field stuff over the course of a six-hour day here in Tempe he met with position coaches offensive coordinator Drew Petzing and JG to go through an install then he met with sports science folks and trainers before coming back to the coaches at the end of the day to be tested on the aforementioned install he aced the process. And then, of course, Austin Ford confirmed on the Dave Pash uh, podcast, Bo, that they felt comfortable the minute he left taking him fourth overall. So, I mean, we make a lot of noise about how disappointed we were we didn't get to chat with him at the Combine. It felt like this was outside of, and Breer does mention this, when Drake May was taken third overall, the trade propositions were gone. Mm-hmm. They would have entertained it, certainly. If Drake May made it to four, Breer says, there's a chance that, It would have been a trade for the Cardinals. When that was dead and buried, MHJ was a Cardinal. Right. There was just the the biggest threat was some team overwhelming the Cardinals with with an asking price or or a trade package that they couldn't decline, right? With with Austin Fort using the analogy of his, he loves his home and he he wants to put roots down with his Mm -hmm. family. But if somebody's going to knock on his door and, and blow him away with a huge offer, He's going to take it right. And, but they also, they are fully content with the prospect that is Marvin Harrison Jr. because he's the perfect mix and marriage of, you know, just natural given ability with work ethic. Uh, and man, are they, did, did they kind of luck out into that spot already? I mean, the fact that there were three quarterbacks that were good enough to go in front of them and that they were going to get the, the, you know, the consensus best player in the draft at fourth overall. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. And you start to see it, and we'll, we'll see more of him once he hits the playing field with the rest of his teammates after the rookie mini camp we saw over the on Friday and over the weekend. But, man, the, you love to see this, this process because how, I guess, not vulnerable it is, but how tight they had to play it to their vest uh, on something that just seems like it's a sure thing. Like when, when we have conversations about the draft, you saw how – protective and how sometimes irate this fan base would get if you would even suggest that they didn't hold the line and draft Marvin. Why we never experienced that. That never happened to this show. We were always in good, good standings with the hold the line folks. Right. Uh, we see in the chat, um, Darren saying, Oh, Dunze already having issues. Well, Rome a little hammy. And again, hopefully Rome's good to go, but Rome at the end of the day, hasn't been able to participate as much as they would have hoped during rookie minicamp. And then not, this is a little off topic. Jurazon Johnny Newton had foot surgery and now he's got an issue with the other foot. So that gives us kind of some insight, really disappointing for Jurazon. Like there it is. That's why they didn't take him. Jurazon Newton, not available, but it's not supposed to be this easy. It was never this easy for Steve Kime. Sometimes you just, if you're Austin Ford, like he's a smart dude. He had foresight to take Paris last year. Sometimes you just get lucky where it's like, hey, we're picking fourth. I don't know if he's going to be available. Three QBs go ahead of us. What are we doing here? That was always I'm, our argument. I'm sorry, we're man. The, the previous regime is is not playing this as well as the current. First yeah. off, like when you have a slam dunk prospect, I don't think the organization would have done its due diligence like the Cardinals did 
as Breer that's pointed fair. out. That's fair. It, like, there's no way, like, Cliff Kingsbury and Steve Kime have probably had no idea what their normal Wednesday was going to look like any given season. They would just no. fly by the seat of their pants. So the the fact that they had that set up, that's that's on brand for JG and Monty Osfort and the entire coaching staff to be that dialed into their process this far out and to kind of get insight on what the, any given player is going to look like. Uh, I, I think that's really valuable because you can see the tape. Like Marvin Harrison Jr. on tape tells you what you feel he's going to be. He's going to be a star in this league, right? He has the, all the playmaking ability and stuff, but what's he going to look like as far as the guy behind the scenes that's going to prepare uh, to to perform on Sundays? And that's what what did we find out about all these kind picks before is they weren't guys that had a solid, rock-solid process that were putting themselves in a position for success on game days. Well, this team even before Steve Kime with Rod Graves, like they had questions. There were too many first round picks that you question whether or not they love football. Like, I mean, Michael Floyd in 2012 didn't fail because of on field product. He failed because off the field. We say the same thing about, I mean, Isaiah Simmons, there were concerns about how much he loved football. Robert Kim Did he love football? Like these were premium picks that the franchise was spending money on. And then everything else was tweener linebackers, right? Guys who couldn't play. It's like, Finally, the Cardinals have married an approach of, hey, here's a really high-level human being that loves football. Oh, and they play a premium position. We're going to marry that together. Paris, left tackle, loves football. Check. Marvin, generational, loves football. Good to go. Just so happen to come from the same university. But, I mean, like, the draft is hard, and the Cardinals would just make it under Kime exponentially more difficult than it needed to be. So our biggest argument throughout the course of this entire offseason is, with the trade down speculation that we would do every day was don't you just feel like it, you're just buying yourself more time as a GM to take the safe pick that everybody wants that checks all the boxes instead of, there is some risk with trading down Quinion Mitchell at 12 or 13 is what we would always talk about. But you look at the players that went there. It's just mm-hmm. for, for, for Austin Ford, it was not worth it. And I commend him for understanding that the week of the draft and, making Marvin the pick because as much as we wanted it to happen and the odds with bet MGM shifted that day when we were heading over to Gila river, we didn't feel comfortable about it until it was announced. Yeah. Well, the Harrison junior camp felt pretty comfortable with it. Like when we talked to senior and they, they asked him about the pre-draft process and how unique it was and opting out from most of the, the, uh, I guess the, the drills and, and the, the the press conference at the combine and the pro day yeah. was in January. They just kind of did the math, right? They they looked at the teams, they looked at the situations, and they forecasted three quarterbacks. And then the best they could do is four. Uh, so why you know go forward with with some of the whole rigmarole? Um, and, and then also Marvin Harrison Jr. trying to stay and keep his body in in good enough shape to where he doesn't hit that rookie wall. He mentioned that as part of the process as well. And his main focus is whichever team selected him, he wanted to be in, in top shape for that. So um, it it really is interesting. And it, it, it's very reminiscent to me at least. And I know it's completely different scenarios, but Monty Austin for the off season before he becomes GM, that he knew he was going to get into some interviews and it's important to have a short list as far as head coaching candidates and to identify some up and comers. And he identified Jonathan Gannon in the summer of 2022 before hiring him in January or February of 2023. Um, and it like them seeing Marvin Harrison jr. In the off season of 2023, that pre-draft process. And then somebody saying, what, well, like take it in now because you're probably not going to see it the next year. Like, and for them that to resonate and for them to kind of take that seriously, it's like good on the organization to, for realizing that and understanding that with a guy with one more collegiate season that he was going to be somebody in the conversation. Imagine being prepared, right? <laughs> yeah. this, this franchise, right. the opposite of that under Common Cliff. 